Hey all, it's Jeremy from Jeremy.net. I am a comic book artist, writer, self-publisher, creator, and I share my comic creation process here on YouTube with you and also on my blog. Um, if you'd like to support this channel, the creation of my comics and these videos, and get more behind the scenes blog posts, advanced exclusive blog posts, and bonus videos, you can go to patreon.com slash Jeremy. If you'd like to get a sample, a free sample, of some of the comics I create, you can go to comics.jeremy.net. And if you would like to buy some of my comics in physical print or in uh, Amazon Kindle, you can go to uh, amazon.jeremy.net. So, let's get started today. Now, I had been working on the cover for the latest issue of Morningstar, issue 7. And I think last week, I believe we were looking at some of the... Uh, we were, I was kind of showing you how I was reworking the color scheme on this to go for more of a deserty sand kind of thing. And since then, I've done a little bit more on it, and we're pretty close to being, being done on this piece. That said... I thought I'd show you something a little bit different from usual. Oh, I see Ion Rocks is uh, is in the chat. Good to see you, man. Thanks for uh, for showing up. Let's see here. So, what I'm gonna do that I actually haven't done, I think, I'm not sure if I've ever shown this process in my YouTube videos before, but I'm gonna. Flip on over to Illustrator, and what I'm doing right now is my, my pre-press phase. What I'm doing is I'm actually assembling, because basically all of the pages except for the cover are gray toned. And what I've been doing is placing my, my artwork in the, the final Illustrator templates, because I've got a template set up. As I've shown before in my process, I start by creating simple panels based on my uh, my thumbnails. These uh, these this just a simple panel layout, and then based on my thumbnails, I also will letter that. I'll create, you know, loose placeholder let lettering. I, I take my what I have in my script, and a lot of times I use this phase as rewriting. I'll put in my letters, and my sound effects. This template that you're looking at right now with the letters is the is what I end up printing out on vellum, and then on vellum I will draw in my uh, my layouts. So what you see here are my finished layouts I've gone through. Um, I flip them on vellum, make some corrections, and I scan in the corrected version. And then what you see here, I will turn off the letters, convert it to a light blue, and I print this whole thing out at 11 by 17 on Bristol board, and that's what I ink. So now comes basically the last stage where I am putting the artwork in the page. So this is page 12. I've got a little keystroke to place the artwork. Let's go into PSDs, page 12. And here's my artwork. So this is the, the finished inked art, and I know that my artboard size, the, the template that makes up the, the largest part of the artboard has an 11 by 17 Bristol board already scaled down. So I know that that size scaled down for this is 7.4 inches, so I just plug that in. And there is something that I have found as a, a weird pre-press issue because even if I'm printing and I'm telling it not to uh, when I print the artwork out I tell it to you know to scale without um, it scales full bleed basically when I when I enlarge this and print it on on, on Bristol board it should be printing it to an 11 by 17 size but for some reason it ends up coming out a little bit larger like the the guidelines that you see <clears throat> I've got guidelines for the areas where the uh, the panel border should end. And I can kind of double check it because I have the panel borders still on this file. And what I end up doing eventually is turning off these panel borders. 
But before I do that, I want to get this basically just sort of lined up here. It's like minor detail work. It's real easy to get it in the ballpark with just the, the numbers I put in, the, um, the 7.4 inches. That gets me in the ballpark. And then to try and get it more precise, I will line this up, switch to the rotate tool, and put a rotation point in this upper corner. Then I go over to the opposite corner and I will grab this corner and I will drag it up so it's parallel with the guideline that's horizontal. Now it also means that it should be, this corner should be lining up with this vertical guideline, which means the page is just a tiny bit too large. So, and actually seeing that this is, in adjusting it, the size has gone up slightly. So who knows, maybe just dropping this back down to 7.4 again will do the trick. Although I doubt it, probably have to go a little bit smaller. That's what I have seen the last couple of times I've been doing this. That just takes a little bit of tweaking. You know, and if you guys, I'm kind of doing this because I want to just mix things up and share stuff that I haven't necessarily shared before. But if you're watching this and you're like, dude, this is boring as hell, go back to working on the cover, let me know. I've still got the cover here. I can go back to it. I have stuff that I, I was planning on working on. And I kind of have both of these processes going at the same time because I'm also not sure. I may end up, because really doing these adjustments for the, the page, it's pretty repetitious. And I may end up blowing through all of them in the course of this video and just be done with it. But also, I was close enough to the end of the cover that I thought I might actually, if I were just to focus on finishing the cover, I might finish that by the end of this video too. Um, something tells me that I've got more than an hour left on that cover just because, I'm going to flip back for a second, a lot of flipping back and forth. At this point, the cover, it's really just a matter of refinement. Cleaning up the edges and the light sources, recoloring the lighting on the noose so it's more of the golden light as opposed to the bright yellow that's on there. Um, painting in just kind of modulating the the feathering in the wings like how much detail I want to put in there because I don't really want to put in much detail and then if I want to add anything to the background to kind of make it pop a little more maybe a little more of a darker tone in the the foreground area and then around the edge of the wings but I don't necessarily want to put a lot of detail in there because I kind of want the background to be abstract so this stage here and I also by the way on my Patreon, I do do bonus videos, and I just posted one yesterday of me getting the, the piece basically from the, um, the stage it was before where I had just worked out the thumbnails and it was still pretty rough. I basically have a video of me working it up into this level. <clears throat> but one of the things that I was talking about in there is that if I knew what I was doing in terms of what it's going to take to make this piece feel finished, the amount of work really is maybe an hour's worth of work. Oh, hey, look at this. I see some more folks in the chat. I see Bear Bear. He, says, he said that this looks awesome. Thank you. Um, I, that's very kind of you to say. Um, how long did it take me to draw? Uh, well, that's kind of hard for me to answer because I would also include, let me turn this on, throw a new layer in here. Oddly enough, it's easier for me to just create a new layer than it is for me to go in and unlock it and switch it from multiply to, uh, to normal. But if you count, first off, there's my rough drawing pencil. I did thumbnails for this. And then eventually this, this drawing is basically, I normally with comp pages, this is what the level of my layouts are. And then I will go in and I'll ink this. I intentionally did not ink this drawing because I've been trying to do my covers in more of a painted style. Sort of like if you look at the thumbnail, not thumbnail, but if you look at the uh, the cover art on my on my channel, the, the large image with, um, of the cowboy with the, the pentagram behind him, that's my version of Lucifer in this comic. I repainted the cover to make it in a, a, in a more painted style as opposed to 
comic art where it's penciled, inked, and then more like flat color. <clears throat> and I really like that look, so I decided for this, going forward, for this cover, and for the rest of the covers I do, I'm going to try and go for that inked look. I mean, that painted look, as opposed to an inked look. In terms of how long it took me to do, I probably have spent, by now, I want to say maybe less than 10 hours. Which, to me, feels like actually kind of a long time. I know a lot of people, when they do digital paintings, they may... Some people will do speed paintings. They'll make a beautiful cover art looking piece in like two or three hours. Some people will spend 20 or 30 hours on a digital painting, but those are probably people that are doing more realism where they don't necessarily have the, the graphic line art that I have in here. And even that on a cover, I don't know. If I were working in one single day straight through, then I would say a 10, 10 hours for a cover isn't bad. Um, trying to put in a lot of extra work and detail. And I probably realistically have another two hours on this piece. So, and, and like I, one of the things I started saying right before I checked uh, the message on the chat was that if I knew exactly what it was going to take to bring this piece into finish, to make it look completely polished, look like everything I wanted, it would take me about one hour. But because a lot of finishing a piece is decision making, trying out a little bit, saying, oh, that's too much detail, not enough detail, I have to blur this out, these lines need to be smudged, these lines are too crisp, these lines need to be more crisp. There's a lot of refinement, and that decision-making process is what makes finishing a piece take longer. So if I knew exactly what the decisions were, it'd probably be another hour's worth. But because I have to make a lot of trial and error, I'm guessing it's probably two, maybe two and a half hours before I'll be done with this. So, ah, damn, everybody showed up. Thank you, guys. Let's see. So... We've got, um, yeah, everybody else is showing up in the chat. Um, Bear Bear says, I feel like a loser when other people, when I look at other people's art and notice how good it is and how bad mine is. Um, that's, you're not, one, you're not a loser. Two, everyone feels like that. I go online. I'm just like you. I look at a lot of people on YouTube, on Instagram. Um, DeviantArt, Twitter, whatever. There's tons of co comic creators and non-comics, just fine art illustrators and fancy illustrators that I look at. When I look at their work, I compare mine and my work doesn't hold up favorably. Um, oh, also, wait. I have more to say on this. I want to give Christian a shout out because I see him in the chat. So it's good to see you too. Um, <clears throat> I will continue. I'm going to continue on the thread of respond to the other comments in the chat. But I had more that I wanted to say specifically about looking at other people's art and feeling like a loser. When I look at the art that other people do that's better than mine, I don't look at it like, oh, I suck, or I'm never going to get there, or it's going to take me forever to get there. When I look at other people's art and I feel that it is better than mine, I look at that as a beacon. I look at it as a lighthouse. I feel like the work that I'm doing right now is just what I... I'm either telling myself I'm capable of or it's the most that I have studied or worked to bring my artwork to a certain level. But when I see somebody who's way better than I am, I show, oh, there's more levels for me to go to. And I know on a conscious level that that's true, but seeing other people whose work kicks my ass, it inspires me. And it doesn't inspire me like, oh, I'm competitive. I'm going to catch up with you. I'm going to beat you. It's like those people are showing me the way. They're showing me, hey, you can do this better. Other people are doing it better. And if you put in the work, you can do it better too. Um, I think a lot of artists will agree. Like people who have been working in art for a long time or the artists that you admire, most of them will tell you that talent is overrated. I might have a little bit of talent. I think I had a talent for drawing when I was a, a, a kid. But as an adult, I have seen that Everything that I am capable of doing, everything in this painting and all the stuff that I'm doing in my comic book pages isn't talent. It is work. It's learning how to draw better. It's studying visual storytelling, studying other artists, taking workshops, um, taking figure drawing classes, which I continue to take on a regular basis. It's all putting in work. So don't feel, don't let other people's quality and success belittle you. Use it as inspiration in the most positive way. Not competitive inspiration, but just 
you can see that they're showing you the way um a piece of advice and i can't remember where i got it and i want to say that it was mentioned on a episode of um the the youtube channel one fantastic week which if you haven't checked that out you definitely should i've gone to one of their workshops it was fantastic it was super inspiring and i've met a ton of great creators both in person and just online through there it it's a great network but one of the things that they recommended was kind of creating a grid of artists grabbing a, a sample of artwork of let's say like a nine a nine grid of squares a, a, a grid of nine squares and you have that surrounded by artists that you admire people who do the work that you would want to do and then putting your work in the middle in that center square and seeing how your work stands up in comparison to those people and that kind of blew my mind because I'm like yeah it's kind of well one it's ballsy to say all right how does my work stand up to say like if I were to put Frank Miller and Walt Simonson in my square uh, James O'Barr the creator of The Crow and um, Guy Davis who who worked on BPRD for a number of years and has done tons of great comics like these are the kind of people that would be on my list and I haven't made those squares yet but maybe I will make it and share it and talk about it but <clears throat> If I were to compare my work to all those artists, yeah, my work doesn't stack up. But the idea of putting my work side by side is to force me not to, to beat myself down, but to say, all right, what do these other pieces have in common? If I am falling down here, if I'm not staying up to the task and the level of theirs, where can I get closer? How can I push my work? So you gotta look at this stuff and looking at other artists, not with that comparisonitis, which is a disease, but look at it as a diagnostic tool to help you get better. So don't, yeah, I'm, I'm real big on not beating yourself up. So back to the chat. I know that was a long rant. Um, I'm also going to flip back over. I'll kind of flip back and forth. I'm not moving the, the screen around as I'm talking, but I'll, I'll continue, you know, explaining what I'm doing as I go. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, so, so Christian's in the chat, and he says, what's up to everybody? He said, what up, homies? Um, Ion Rocks commented in that it's a matter of how much time you want, um, time you put into what you want, and which is very true, and I agree. Um, and then they're also, they're talking about what type of comics do you make, and now this is the guys talking about uh, their, their own process and their work. I'm in a strange phase where it feels like I'm completely rethinking everything and I'm not able to produce. And that is, you know, that's a phase that we all go through. I mean, I think about the fact that I'm do, I've put so much work into doing this Western comic book, but I know that I don't want to just do Westerns or Supernatural Westerns or Afro Westerns, which is one of the hashtags I should have put on when I posted this, uh, this link for the latest video. But, yeah, um, figuring out what you want, it... I, I'm more of a the mindset of figuring out what I want by making stuff. I already know the next few projects I'm going to be doing after Morningstar, and it does bother me that I have not consciously chosen to create, that they don't have the cohesive theme that artists probably should have. It, if you want to build a body of work, it is good to not do the same story over and over again, but to have a connective thread that artists can say, oh, this is the guy who does, I don't know, um, urban, uh, urban fantasy or magical realism, or, I don't know, um, gender-bending uh, superhero comics. There's a whole wide variety of, of whatever possible genre you can come up with, but I think it's, okay. it's also okay to not know what you're doing. I personally like to work through that by making stuff. So they, there's an expression that I'm, I've been repeating so much over the past week to other people, but the more I think about the truer it is, which is that, and I don't remember who said it, I gotta relook it up so I can give proper attribution, but life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forward. And that idea of, you know, knowing everything or figuring everything out ahead of time, it's just, it's tough. You know, you, you can't anticipate everything that is going to feel right to you later, and you can't anticipate how other people are going to react to things. There's a lot of stuff that's out of your control. All right, back to the chat. So Christian asks, will you show us your painting process? I'm mega in uh, interested. And yeah, um, I was just showing sort of the layout of uh, comic pages. I'll finish laying out this, um, 
not laying out, but I'll, the pre-press work. So I'll finish adjusting this page and then I'll go back to that cover I showed you and I'll finish working on that. <clears throat> Ian Rock says, I see it as inspiration and I find great inspiration in watching you, Jeremy. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. You're one of my biggest supporters. I always like it when we get to get together and chop it up. I'm glad you show up every week to, to, to watch the chat. I, I really appreciate that. That means a lot to me. Um, Bear Bear says, uh, thanks for that, dude. I have another way to see it now. Um, can you introduce me to your original characters at some point? I want to make a comic, but I struggle to keep drawing a character more than like one time after the design. Do you make superhero comics? Uh, so, no, I don't make superhero comics. And the reason why, now I'm going to answer the question while I finish adjusting this page. The reason why I don't make superhero comics is because Marvel and DC do it better than anybody else. I mean, yeah, there's also, a, I should say that realistically, I prefer a lot of the stuff that's coming out from Image these days to just about anything else. But Image, Dark Horse, they also make great superhero comics. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to leave other companies out. I mean, hell, um, Dynamite, um, Boom, they've been making really cool comics over the past few years, like making big strides. Um, but yeah, point being is that the American comic book market is still predominantly superheroes. And if I want to stand out, to me, it seems like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna win that battle. I'm not gonna make superhero comics better than Marvel and DC. And the idea of creating characters that people are gonna love more than Spider-Man and Batman and Superman, that's just unlikely. So I thought, well, what are my other interests? What do I want to do? What do I what kind of books do I want to read? That's really what I'm trying to do. Um, with every comic I make. The, the idea behind it is it's something that I would read if I saw it on the stands. So for me, the idea of doing a, uh, a supernatural western about Lucifer before he fell. I mean, at this point, now we're watching the... We're in the last... It's The issue I'm working on is seven out of an eight-issue series. So we're working... You're kind of seeing the last, the last bits of this series... So at this point, yeah, Lucifer is becoming the Lucifer that we, we know. He's, he's kind of seeing his, his dark side come out. But my idea was kind of showing the journey of how and why he got there. So it's not an apology for him. It's not trying to make Lucifer into a hero. It was more of me asking the question of, well, how does someone go from being the brightest of all the angels to being the source of evil? And that just, I, the idea that he was supposed to be perfect. And how does he get to, to what he ends up being? That sounded like a, a really fascinating concept to me, and that's what my, my comic is about. So, in terms of introducing you to the characters, let's see here. Um, well, right here, you know, this particular page is not a great example of the characters, and I wish I had a really good group shot. That's probably something I will have to do at, a, at some point, is do a, a really nice group shot. But... You know, I'll just go into him right here. So, this character is um, Michael, the, the Archangel Michael, eventually ends up becoming the leader of the Archangels once Lucifer really goes to the dark side. But Michael starts off as Lucifer's second-in-command and his best friend. They're basically, they're like brothers. You know, they would love each other, they would die for each other. They're just incredibly close. And this story is also about friendship and brotherhood. And I think we've all had friends that we were really cool with, that we were super tight with, and then they started going down a dark path. And at a certain point, you're like, I can't, I can't co-sign with you anymore. I can't, I can't roll with what you're doing. And then what happens when that friendship is tested and then eventually disintegrates? So, yeah, Michael, the story is just as much about Michael's rise into his position as an archangel as it is Lucifer's fall. This other woman that he's actually having the, uh, the altercation with right now is another one of the Archangels, Remiel, who ends up kind of... The, the Archangels end up, of course, you know, it's this rebel angels kind of taking sides, and Remiel sort of ends up kind of siding with Lucifer in his fall. The other characters, well, the one who is here staring through the noose, this is Raphael. 
he's uh, kind of a young, more rebellious. Now, oddly enough, not rebellious like rebe rebelling with Lucifer. It would be a lot to get into in terms of uh, what his actual personality is right now. It's probably easier. You know what I just realized? At the top of the show, I had mentioned comics.jeremy.net. If you go there, there's a preview of every issue. So you can read the first, I think, 12 pages of, of issue one on there. This is uh, my version of Lucifer. And if you go back and you read the, that, you can get basically get a breakdown of all the characters. But there's seven archangels. There's um, Lucifer, Michael, Raphael, Uriel, who's kind of the angel of death. He's like this big, larger-than-life character. Very quiet, but strong, silent type. Um, instead of Gabriel, I wanted there to be more female archangels, so I made Gabriel into Gabrielle. And then there's Remiel, who you saw, and Ariel. So you can get a look at all those characters if you go to uh, comics.jeremy.net and download one of the previews there. Let me check the chat a little bit. Um, oh, I see Bobby Williams in the chat. Hey, Bobby, thanks for stopping by. Good to see you. Um, Bear Bear says, I, I really want to come here um, some more when I can. Christian recommends, uh, if, you haven't read, if you haven't read Invincible, you haven't lived. Slow start, strong everything else. And I, I will co-sign on that. I have read up to and through the Viltrumite War. I have not read the, the last probably, I don't know, 30, maybe 40 issues of Invincible, so I haven't read it through to the ending. But that said, it is one of the most amazing comic series I've ever read. The, the ending of the first 12 issues, the actual confrontation between Mark and his dad, I still cry when I read that. It gets me choked up because I have a pretty close relationship with my dad, kind of the way that before Mark and his dad were sort of on opposite sides, kind of the way they were in the beginning. That's sort of the relationship I have with my dad. And I know that if I had to go through what he goes through with his dad in those first 12 issues, it would just, it would break my heart. I would just be broken. I would look the way Mark feels at the end of his fight, first fight with his dad. Um, so yeah, it's a fantastic book. Bear Bear mentions he's from England and wants to make his own British superheroes. And, oh, you, you asked about getting physical copies of my book. Again, if you go to, and you know what, it's interesting. I noticed that I have a lot of people, you can order my book on, uh, on amazon.jeremy.net. So that's where you can get a physical copy of my book. It's also available on Amazon Kindle. And the interesting thing is I notice uh, like half the time when I get orders, they're from the UK. And I'm very grateful for it. I'm not sure why this book is, is carrying so well overseas, but I, I re I'm, I'm really glad that folks across the pond are enjoy enjoying it, so. Um. <laughs> Christian said, going back to Invincible, when you start it up again, prepare your feelings. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've heard that some heavy shit goes down. So I will, I'll, I'll have my, my comfort food and my blanket, curl up with my wife and, and prepare to have my heart broken. Um, all right, so let me get back to finishing up this layout and so we can get back to some digital painting. All right, so all I did was just a tweaking and adjusting the... Um, the, the positioning of the page, because even though it's the right scale, when you scan stuff in, it shifts around a little bit, and it didn't line up perfectly with um, with the way the artwork originally was laid out in the panels. So, oh, those are wrong panels. All right, here we go. So yeah, like basically these are the, the panel borders that I originally had in Illustrator before I drew it. So I can turn off the panel borders in here because I print these panels on the pages when I'm actually going to ink them. So now, this page is pretty much ready. Um, the last thing that I do, and I've been actually making one tiny alterca alt not altercation, alteration. Let me open a page before this. When I scan my, um, not scan, when I, when I save my pages for di different platforms, I have two different artboards. I have an artboard for the print comic that I send, you know, that I send off to the printer. 
Then I have an artboard for it that has a little extra bleed because I print my trades on Comixology. And then the last artboard, I just started adding a new one now that's a, a digital a um it's a digital crop and it's just barely outside of the uh the safe area. And the point for this is that when I print the, when I send the books, when I put them on Kindle, if they use the the artboard that I use for Create Space, well they call it Kindle um Kindle Direct Publishing now, but it used to be called Create Space. And when you uh save out artwork for your print version, I'm, so I'm creating a new artboard in Illustrator that I'm calling Digital because if I just used the, um, the print version, the, the print cropping, the bleed that's on there, it leaves a lot of extra space on a digital screen that I don't want. Um, and then the, the page just looks smaller and I don't want it to look smaller. I want it to be as large as possible to show up you know, as good as possible on whatever device someone's reading it. So I've been creating an, a, another crop in here that I just call, another artboard that I call digital. And it just saves out that artwork at a tighter crop so it'll look a little bit better if you're reading it on a tablet or, or some other device. So, Now that I've got these artboards here, so I've got three different artboards, and then I just, I go to File Export, but I just have a keystroke to do it, which is why you didn't see me go up to File. Save them all out as CMYK, because even though the book's gonna be black and white, I send them to the printer as CMYK. The ones I send to Comixology, I have to convert back to RGB, but it's easy to just stick with CMYK for all the stuff that's print and I save out, and what it does is it saves out a version of this comic with each of these three croppings. The, the really tight art board, this board for the, the single issue comic that's into the printer, and then this larger version that I use for, um, for the, the Kindle slash uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon Direct Publishing Trade Edition. So I just save that art board. Save the file, which Illustrator is being a little slow. And uh, while that's saving, I can check the chat. So, uh, let's see here. So Bear Bear says, is it impossible for any other superhero comic makers to come up to the place in popularity where Marvel and DC now are? Oh, oh, yeah. Where DC are now, I flipped them a little bit. I don't want to say that it's impossible because I believe anything is possible. I do believe that Marvel and DC's dominance over the comic industry is going to continue. But I, I limit this way. I think it could be possible that someone else, some other company, could become as popular or you know take over their dominance. But I don't think it would happen overnight. I think it would be a series of characters that really capture someone's imagination and those characters are all under one roof and it really comes down to if people have the same love for that world like for instance Mike Mignola Hellboy the movies I think have been generally pretty well received and I think people are really excited about the new one with the uh, the guy from Stranger Things playing Hellboy um, the BPRD has its own universe there's other characters that Mignola has I think if he really slowly spread that out and expanded the, the more of the characters and more of the stories, that's something that could become its own universe. I think other people have tried to create... It comes down to creating a series of characters that happen to be from one company that people care about. DC, you know, it wasn't built like... DC didn't become DC all at once. They had Superman, and Superman was incredibly popular. They had Batman, and Batman was incredibly popular. You know, as they added Wonder Woman, it's like they added these other characters. And eventually, when you look at the characters that make up the Justice League, it's them taking their most popular characters and making a super team out of them. But even with that, there have been highs and lows and ups and downs. Marvel and DC have both teetered on verge of bankruptcy multiple times. Um, 
I think that that's a question of, is it possible? Yes. Is it likely to happen? I don't necessarily think so, but you can't really worry about that. If you want to make superhero comics, I'm not saying don't make them. I'm just saying I don't. I personally don't want to try and compete with Marvel and DC, so I try to think of what are other stories I'm interested in that aren't superhero stories. When I was younger, I did have a lot of ideas that were superhero stories because superheroes are what I grew up on and what got me interested in comics. But that said, as I've gotten older and my tastes have grown and changed, I've become interested in other topics. If superheroes are where your heart is, then make the best superhero comic you possibly can. Try not try to respect the things about superhero genre that make them great, but also try to find ways to make it your own, to do something that Marvel or DC hasn't done or wouldn't do. Um, not just to be shocking or controversial, but because you believe in it. Something that you feel... Try to take all the things that you love about superheroes and make them your own. Christian asks, will there be a collected version of Morningstar? Yes, there's already a collected version that's on Amazon. Again, amazon.jeremy.net. So that... Uh, there's a trade that has issues one through four on Amazon right now. There will eventually be a second trade that has issues five through eight. And once that's done, I'm going to be working on some other projects. I'm not going to say that I'm going to release a collect edition that has everything right away. It may be like maybe a year or two down the line. I might do a Kickstarter campaign and do a hardcover collected edition. I haven't decided yet how I'm going to do it, but I think that probably for the foreseeable future, it's going to be those two trades are going to collect the whole story. So you can get the first trade is out now. The second trade will probably be out, oh, I'm going to say it's going to be maybe around this time next year, because once I finish up this issue, I still have to finish up that last issue and then assemble the trade, assemble some extra back matter and, and, um, and details. So that last issue, my goal is to have the final issue of Morningstar done before the end of 2019, which I know it's super slow and I apologize for that. But again, I'm doing all this stuff while working around a day job. So only so many hours a day in the day to make stuff. But the whole series, my goal is to have it wrapped up by 2019 and then to have a trade out of the, the second trade out in early 2020. So let's see. Back to the chat, Bear Bear asks, is it okay to make comics not looking to be big or popular? And I, I'm, you shouldn't ask other people, is it okay to do this? Is it okay to do that? Do whatever you want. I mean, you may, and the other thing you, you have to remember is a lot of times people find success flying in the face of advice. People will tell someone that will never work. No one will buy it. No one will, will read it. You may take a concept to like five different publishers and all those publishers reject it and then you self-publish it and it becomes a smash hit. I'm not saying that will happen. I'm not saying that even if your idea is good that that will happen. But don't make your decisions around is something okay or not okay because comics doesn't have... It, it's, one of, it's one of the hardest industries to get noticed because it's one of the easiest ones to quote unquote break into you don't really need to break into anything you can just make your comics and start publishing them um yeah there's gatekeepers in terms of diamond comics has to review it and decide something they want to carry yes you actually have to make a book that retailers feel like they can sell and that they feel like there's an audience for in their customers but even if they if diamond and different retailers won't carry it you can still sell it at conventions you can sell it direct online so the most important thing is to make a book that you feel is a quality book, and it's a book that you're passionate about. I always say I try to make things that I would want to read. And if it's a book that I want to read, then I figure hopefully there's other people out there that share my tastes. Um, Bear Bear also mentions that Comixology is Amazon's biggest collection of digital comics and manga. Um, I, too, have my... My comics are also the individual issues are available on Comixology. I don't have that up here because I don't want to throw you guys with hundreds of screens, like uh, links to different places where I, my stuff's available online. Um, again, at jeremy.net, uh, there's a link for all of them. But you can also go to comicsology.jeremy.net and that's a place where you can get the individual issues in, uh, in digital form. 
I see Amaris is in the chat. Thank you for showing up. Uh, Bear Bear says, I wouldn't try competing with them, meaning Marvel and DC. I just want to share my, my story, my stories. Ion Rock says, I am obsessing over Awakened Humans. We're back to, to his content, what, what he wants to do. And again, it's just a matter of finding ways that you want to explore it. I should probably draw some more because I've been just talking and not drawing anything. So let me get back into this. All right, I'm gonna speed through, because it's hard for me to draw and read, I can't draw and read the chat. I can draw and talk about answers, but let me just read through the, some of the chat stuff and then we'll get into a little bit more of the digital painting. Because as it is, we've, we're already at like 1140 and I haven't been painting. Um, so Christian says, when it comes to making comics, superhero or otherwise, you need to understand you're making them, not only for your target audience, but for you, once you realize the popularity of others is okay, I, I co-sign on that. You gotta, you don't want to make stuff in a vacuum where you make stuff for you, but that no one else is going to care about. And you don't want to make stuff just for the market because that can be soul crushing and, and soul killing. If you're making stuff for other people and you don't really care about it, um, and there's no guarantee that it's going to hit a mark. Like, like you said, you started with superhero stuff. If superheroes are what sells most, then it makes sense that everyone would just say, well, I'm just going to make more superheroes. And even though superheroes are fantastic, I love superheroes. I, in fact, just bought uh, Tom King and Mitch Jarrett's Mr. Miracle trade because that just came out. I read a couple of issues, like just sampled them, and I thought they were fantastic. So I knew it was a book I wanted to read when it came out in trade. Um, but yeah, if you're just doing stuff because superheroes are what's popular, you're going to get lost in the shuffle because Marvel and DC kind of have it on lock. Um... Bear Bear says, I have a lot of um, cat-based original characters. I don't know if that would be good or bad. Um, I know bad ideas somehow get big, but amazing ideas don't. You can't predict what is or is not going to be big. That's something you have no control over. Like, you look at film. Film is a great example. There's lots of movies that come out, like for instance, Fight Club is one of my all-time favorite movies. That was a bomb at the box office. It became a cult classic on DVD and, and video, and now people love it, and you know, it's, it has the audience it deserves. But at the time it came out, it was not well received. There's lots of great movies that did not hit their audience when it first came out. Don't try, you can't game the system into, the only thing you can do is make it, is promote it, get it in front of as many people as possible. But the audience has to decide whether they like it or not. And sometimes just because people like something that doesn't make it good and just because they hate it doesn't mean it's bad. You have to start with, okay, you have, yeah, well, that's, Christian again, dude, you're on point. Because what he says after that is when it comes to creating comics or anything worth it, nothing is actually okay and everything is, you, everything you do is a risk. You just have to be willing to take it. You know what? That just right on word. That that's it right there. You you're saying everything. I don't even need to just say nothing. That 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 sums it up right there. I see Wakey J eight sevens in the chat, and he says to Bear Bear, uh, Neil Gaiman has a rule which is never make art for the money. Make good art that makes you happy, and to keep making good art. If others like it, then if others like it then or not money shouldn't be a driving force you know it's funny i keep seeing those ads for uh, for neil gaiman's master class and i want to take them just because i would like hearing him talk i just sit there and listening to him like I, I know that there's a couple of his audiobooks that i've listened to where he does the reading and like i could just sit here and sit and listen to him talk about writing all day long I mean, it's not even for me about the educational part i just like listen to him talk about the craft um and is it just me or is he slowly starting to look more and more like gandalf like he's the writing gandalf um, so Bear Bear says uh, I never did it for the money Ion Rock says I'm completely selfish look at the Thundercats um, so, and Bear Bear says would you check out my comics if I make any well um, I will tell you that I know when you post links in the chat a lot of times YouTube will hold them and make sure that they're not spam if you want you can send the links in the, the comments or you can send a message to me through just my link on the, the channel. Um, but yeah, if you send me a, a link to it, I'll, I'll take a look. 
I'm not saying that I'll necessarily have time to read if they're they're long comics or, or a lot, but I'll I'll take a quick look. Uh, but yeah, I mean that's the, one of the things. I don't know if I'll necessarily have time to give an in depth or thorough analysis, only because. I feel like I barely have time to to do the comics that I, you know, I have so much. All right, I'm trying to clear my thoughts. I'm talking and moving and drawing at once. I have so many things that I'm trying to get done in terms of writing and drawing and making comics that I don't necessarily I don't necessarily have as much time to read the comics that I want to read. Now, I don't really think I'm going to be able to get a, into a lot of the painting. So, Christian, because this painting is as far along as it is, a lot of what I'm doing here is just refinement. So I think it's probably easier, if you want to see my painting process, for me to turn off layers and show you what I've done, as opposed to me just painting in painting from where I am now, because I don't think there's a lot that... I don't think there's necessarily... You're going to learn as much from the finishing stuff I'm doing now or you'll see as much of an inside of my process as if I show you what I've been doing. So I have a layer. First off, when I had my, my rough, hmm, you know what, let me just turn off all of these and show you where I was. So I started with my rough pencil sketch and originally I was gonna do a page that was very green. Now this, I kind of call it flats, but all this is just sh shapes just masking out and separating the wings from the figure, from the noose, from the background. That's all this is. Now the, originally I'd started painting in like a lot of, of green background because I was trying to pick a color that I hadn't used on a cover before. Like I've done blues, I've done reds, um, purples, like different color keys. So I was saying, all right, I haven't done a green. Let me do a green cover. But after getting pretty far on painting this in, I've gotten rid of most of that, but I realized that that green tone just did not feel like a western. Like there were trees and leaves around the top, like he was, like he was standing at the bottom of a tree in a forest, and it just didn't feel westerny. So I went back and I looked at a bunch of reference. I looked at um, at Frederick Remington. He was a great western painter. Unfortunately, I looked up kind of stuff reading his bio. Incredibly racist. Hated. Um, blacks, Jews, Poles, um, the Irish, just like a lot of the, the stuff that you would see like in the, the 1800s when people would come to America and they see signs where it'd say like no, no, no Jews, no black, no Irish, or no, like they would just say like they, they, basically he, he would refer to all the different ethnicities in Europe that weren't say British or French, and you would just call them the uh, the N words of Europe. So, just great artist, brilliant artist. I still take inspiration from his work. Horribly racist. Um, I don't even know why I'm sharing that. It's just one of those things where I read and I was kind of like, oh, like I was bummed out. And it always it's always shitty when you find somebody who's a really awesome artist, like is a really shitty human being. But Still, he's a dope-ass artist. Dope enough that I ha I'm not throwing his book out. I still use it for reference. But I went to these... Um, <clears throat> so I went to just this more sandy, like, sandy brown, you know, yellow background. And then trying to do some of those more contrasty uh, light blue shadowed casts. So, you know. And then I went in and added some... Let me turn the, the line art off. When I was doing this, I was kind of going back and forth between adding, um, <clears throat> between looking at the line art while I was putting in, like, it's it's kind of silly for me to even call this a digital painting per se, because it's more of a digital drawing in color. I went through and I was going back and forth, like I would turn on the line art in low opacity, draw in these details in blue, and then just sort of like turn it on and off and on and off. And eventually, like this is much more of a drawing than it is a painting. And I'm going to go in through here and selectively blur out and smudge some of these lines. So they're not as crisp and have them bleed into each other. But you can see how this is much more like a ragged drawing than it is a full-on painting. But I got this in. At this point, I kind of feel like, all right, this is starting to shape up like what I'm looking for. And then I added in a layer with like the blood splatter and like he gets hit in the head in this issue. So I want to have like blood running down his face and just the idea of 
There's something about the blood running around the eyes, so it has a sensation of tears that I thought was visually dramatic. So that for me was just a, a big thing that, that really helped me lock in to the tone and the feel of this piece. But I mean, that was again, something that I had in those, in these rough pencils. I'd already worked out that whole blood thing running down the, the face, or like through his eyes. <clears throat> and then from there, at this point, I think I had turned off the pencils, turn those off, and I was just trying to paint from here on out finishing and I, I know that I still have more contrast that I want to add to this piece so that's when I came in and really oh I left out a major part of this story when I was doing this and I think you can go back and watch last week's video Christian if you didn't see last week's what I did last week you can see you'll see the green version that I had that I was not happy with and then you'll see me paint this thumbnail that I have in the corner so what I had before was a piece that I was not happy with. And then in the corner, I just started painting this little digital thumbnail. And this isn't blurry just because it's small. It's blurry because I didn't want to get lost in detail. So I intentionally kept it just blobs. But my goal in drawing this thumbnail was me working out what I really wanted my color scheme to be. So after I looked at those Frederick Remington pieces, and I also looked at an artist named Gabriel Leonard. He's a contemporary artist, but he does a lot of Western work. Um, his stuff is fantastic. I, I love his work. He's awesome. Um, I didn't want to rip off his work, but I wanted to look at it and see kind of like he his pieces feel like Westerns. So I wanted to look at how he does that and then try to figure out my own way of creating that feel. So I made this little thumbnail piece, and then I went back and re-keyed the piece. So that's where... When you see like the gold light, when I turned on this uh, this light layer, I had already worked out that this lighting, he was gonna have like rim lighting coming, spilling over his shoulders. And that's what all of this is. And let me, I'll wrap this up and then hop back to uh, the chat to see what else you guys are talking about. Um, when I did this, the background that I had originally painted looked more like a forest ground. I wasn't quite happy with it. I threw on a, a very faint perspective grid and you don't really need to see it, but I'll turn up the opacity just so you can see. So I made a uh, just a really quick perspective grid just to figure out how I wanted to block in the ground below him. Because I'm not going to have it very detailed, but I wanted to give it the sense that you're looking down onto the ground that he is standing on, looking up at you. Like you're up in the tree looking down at him through the noose. So it's one of those subconscious things, and I may need to go in and firm up the background based on this grid a little bit. But that was uh, one of the other things I did before I went in and painted in a lot of the, the detail in the actual figure. So just trying to figure out what's going on in the environment was one of the, the big steps for me in terms of working out this piece. And one of the big things that working on this cover reminded me of and I actually had this conversation with my wife last night about lessons. <laughs> I feel bad because I see how much is popping off on the chat and I had just been talking and not going on that. So I'm going to try and run back and, and respond to everybody um, after I, I, I wrap up walk, talking you through how I got here. But what I was talking to my wife about the other night was that I can't say that I have learned lessons. What it is is that I get reminded of things I know that I should be doing. And specifically with this thumbnail, when I did the the cover for Morningstar, the uh, that image that's, oh wait, I need to flip over there, I can just go. Yeah, this, this image that's right here, you know, on the, the cover out of my channel, you can see it's a full shot where you can see his wings and his body. When I did this piece, I did probably five or six small ink studies. Then I did probably another three or four studies on toned paper, still in black and white, working out the lighting, but also working out what I want the cropping to be. Then I probably did about five to eight color studies in watercolor and some in pencil to work out the colors. I didn't do any of that for this cover. I just had done my... Uh, my pencil art, and then dove in. And 
having that piece with the green color scheme and being as unhappy with it as I was made me, it reminded me, because I, I probably will make this mistake again, but you know, you guys have seen from my channel that thumbnails are the thing I harp on the most in the comic book creation process. I thumbnail the hell out of every page before I draw it. I gotta do color thumbnails. I gotta do color studies in the future to keep myself limber in terms of working with color. Because it reminds me of how if I only do like one or two color pieces a year, then my sense of color is not gonna be great. And I'm not saying that this color scheme is bad, but I'm saying I would have gotten to it sooner. And I think that there's probably things in this that I don't see now that I may look back in a year and say, oh, I should have made that color choice instead of this one. And I accept that. There's no way for me to look, make, force myself to see into the future. I just make the best art I can with the mental and physical tools I have with me now. But point being is, I fell down on the color thumbnails. I just thought I could just waltz right in and just go straight to color without doing my homework. So the same way you gotta do thumbnails to do your storytelling, you gotta do your thumbnails to do color pieces. Now, I think the difference with that is, let's say that you're a professional comic book colorist, they're working in color all day long. They, they swim in it, they live in it. They can, I actually don't know if color artists will do simple squares to create kind of a, a Pixar style color script of the whole story before going in. But I think that they, the more you do something, the better a sense of it you have. And I think that they can probably, you know, work from a more intuitive sense or like I've, I have heard of some colorists opening up like all 22 pages of an issue and then quickly color keying all of them, looking at them to see how the, the story flows and then going and doing detail. Even that is something that in my mind is a form of thumbnailing. And that's for somebody who's doing color nonstop. So for me who only does a color piece here and there, I got to do, I, even with this, only because I'm rushing to get it ready for, for WonderCon, I just did the one thumbnail that I'm happy with. Truth be told, I probably should have forced myself to do at least three or four color thumbnails before going into this. And to tie this into doing color work and cover design in general, because I saw some questions about that. Realistically, in, when I do series in the future, even if I know that my cover ideas may change, I'm gonna try and do color studies for an entire series. Like if it's a 12 issue series, then I'm gonna try and do color studies for 12 colors covers, which may mean, you know, three studies per cover. So I may end up with like say, you know, 36 color thumbnails just to work out the color scheme for the entire series. So I can kind of try to tie all of the colors together, not necessarily with the same color scheme across all the covers, but I can decide simply the same way you may do like three panels that are dark and then one panel that's light because it's got contrast. Um, on a one given page to try and treat those 12 covers as if they're telling a story. Like as, as if you were doing a 12 panel comic book page, except it's the covers and saying, well, how do I want to tell the story over the course of these covers? If that was your issue, that's a great way to think of it. If those covers unto themselves were one comic page and you were going to take your entire series and say, all right, I'm going to thumbnail out this whole series as covers, that's the story. And try to tell it through those images, both in, in black and white thumbnails and then in color. That's gonna be what I'm gonna do for my next series. And I wish I had known, or I had figured that out in the first place. I just saw a little alert come up on my screen for my, uh, I've got figure drawing class tomorrow. I'm looking forward to that. All right, guys, so I totally, I, I'm sorry that I didn't spend as much time actually painting painting, but I felt like you would probably learn more from this than from uh, from just watching me work on finishing the page. I'm going to go back here and take a quick look at the chat because we're at 12 now. I'm not going to bounce just yet. I'm going to go through, see if there's more stuff to answer chat-wise, and then we'll probably wrap up. So if you've got other questions while I'm, I'm running through the chat, throw them in here, and then... Um, and then I guess we'll we'll call it a day. Although, and and, and Christian, if there's any anything particular you want to see on the, the digital painting, let me know, and I can try and address it real quick before we we call it a day. But um, <laughs> Bear says Bear Bear says, would you listen to Neil Gaiman talk about? Uh, it says fishes, but I think it's fishes. Um, I don't know if that's what you meant, but yeah, I would listen to him talk about just about anything. He's fantastic. Um. 
Who will listen to Neil Gaiman talk about poop? If anyone could talk about, uh, could tell interesting poop stories and make them sound wonderful, it would be Neil Gaiman. Um, Wakey, Wakey J87 says, the, the writing Gandalf is Alan Moore, surely. You know what? Yes, yes, that is true. You know, particularly with the, the hair and the beard. But just in looking at him, looking at, at, um, at Neil Gaiman in the master class videos, he's starting to feel like, like, here's the thing. Alan Moore sounds like the crazy Gandalf, like the Gandalf that, um, that you meet in the beginning of the story who seems like just kind of a, a crazy ass wanderer. Um, Neil Gaiman kind of sounds like the, the wisdomy, like when, whenever Gandalf is sitting down and giving Frodo those, the serious, like encouraging talks where it's like, it's heavy gravitas, the world's coming down around him, but he's like, it's going to be okay, Frodo. You, you, you can do this. You can make this. You're going to be okay. Um, you have to believe in yourself. That's the kind of stuff where I, where I hear Neil Gaiman's voice. Um, let's see here. Christian's down with that. Um, Bear Bear asked for tips on how to make front covers, which I saw that when I was glancing down at the chat before. So that's why I kind of went into the details of what I would do across a series of covers in the future and what I wish I'd done with these covers. So I hope that what I just said about covers will address that. Um, Bear Bear says, uh, some of the people you love to are just jerks. Um, and Christian says, that's true, but you're in the right place now. We've got, you. yes, we do got your back, man. Um, Christian says, the way you're painting reminds me of another one of my favorite DC artists, Francis Manipal. I, I think that Manipal is fantastic. I haven't spent enough time reading his, uh, his work, but I, his flash run was fantastic. I've, it's more like I've read a few issues here and there of his. I haven't sat down and read a long run of one of his comics, but he's another guy whose work I think is fantastic. Um, Bear Bear, you know, he says, I can listen to you talk about art for 24 hours. It's very interesting. That is probably the kindest thing I could hear. I appreciate that because I do worry about the fact that I do get repetitive sometimes. I don't want to feel like I'm beating the, a, a dead horse about the same subject. Um, I will tell you that if you look at how many videos I have on my channel, there probably are about, there's definitely more than 24 hours worth of listening to me talk. So you can always run through and, and list, go, the, the back catalog is always there. You can go back. I think my very first, like maybe 10 videos don't have any audio at all. They're just like some, some background music. But after that, I kind of got into the slowly but surely into narrating my process and talking. Um... There is a name here, and I apologize. It's in Cyrillic, so I can't pronounce the name. But uh, they're asking, any plans for different projects aside from Morningstar? Well, once I complete Morningstar, my next project is a book about outlining comics. So it's going to be writing, but it's specifically the outlining process, because a lot of people find outlining boring, or they find it challenging, and... I feel like I've come up with a process that makes challenge outlining enjoyable. It makes it fun. And if, if anything, I feel like it simplifies the process. So it's not an overwhelming task. And if you want to get a sneak peek of that, um, I have one in my, my popular videos section on my channel. There's one on, on writing a comic from start to finish. And the book that I'm going to produce is going to be basically an expansion of that talk, but I'm gonna include a lot, the video has samples from the first issue of Morningstar. I'm gonna include a lot more, like all of my thumbnails from the first issue, um, my full script and outline, and I'm gonna go into some additional ways in which my writing has changed since I made that video. So that's gonna be my next project. Now in terms of actual comic books, the next thing I'm gonna do is a one-shot story that is a, a follow-up to my original, my first graphic novel, Eye of the Gods, which is a psychological thriller. Then I'm going to do a four-issue miniseries that's a, a follow-up. So the, the one-shot is just to get things kind of warmed up. And I'm probably going to experiment with doing it in an I, a more mobile-friendly format, something similar to, to what's on Webtoons. And I think I'm going to do it as a webcomic. So I'm going to do that and then see how that goes. 
and based on that, then do like the, the four issue story that I want to do. And then I already actually have three other projects lined up after that that are comics. And I don't, I, it's too soon for me to tip the hat on that. Because I mean, like I said, it's going to take me the rest of the year to get that last issue of Morningstar done and get the, the trade out for the, the following one. So we're already talking, if you include that plus the, the, the two follow-ups to Eye of the Gods, we're already talking at least two or three years down the line before you see something beyond those. So it's still a bit premature to talk about other projects, but yeah, I definitely have stuff that, uh, that I'm going to be doing. UL's in the chat and asks, do you ever find the studies always hold solid or evolve over time, sometimes changing completely? They definitely change completely. I will, when I do studies, I will, if I see something in the pieces I'm working on it, I will deviate from the study, even if I'm really happy with it. I will try to come back to the study and make sure that I'm continuing to keep whatever I found that felt right about the piece, I will try to keep those things alive in the final piece, but I'm not afraid to deviate from those studies. And a lot of times what I will do is I'll make two or three studies and none of them are perfect, but I will do maybe a final study where I will, I will take the best pieces of each of those three previous studies and try and combine them into a super study that says, okay, this is what my thesis statement is like if you were writing a paper you know like you when you have to write papers in schools you have to start with what is your main idea and then what are your arguments and then basically in the paper you state those start arguments and at the end you come back and and say this is what i stated and why what i believe is true i apply that to to drawing my thumbnails are my thesis statement what is this piece saying in a larger scheme and then you know so but yes i definitely will deviate the the when I look at the thumbnails, they're, to me, they're a tool. The color studies and the thumbnails are there to get me to the place where I can make the finished piece. Um, they don't have to match. Um, what's my opinion on Mobius? Um, my opinion is that he's a genius. I wish he were still alive. I'm sorry he's gone. I love his comics. Um, over the course, I think I had already started um, Morningstar when I had finally gotten a copy of um, his blue. I found a translated version of Blueberry. He has a, a western called Lieutenant Blueberry. It's a beautiful series. Um, it's one of those where if you read it, it'll make you real hesitant to do a western because it's so good. There's no way you can imagine doing a comic as good as his western. But Lieutenant Blueberry is an incredible inspiration. I've gone through and read and reread that. Um, that's one of those where it's inspiring, but it's hard to look at. Cause I'm like, oh, I'm never, ever, ever going to be that good. Um, but yeah, I think everyone, I, who, okay. You said, what's my opinion of Mobius? Who has ever answered that question with Mobius sucks? No one. No, who doesn't like Mobius? I mean, I'm sure there is somebody out there, but I have never run into someone who had a disparaging thing to say about Mobius's work. Um... Bear Bear says, I'm going to make uh, mythological and superhero comics in my spare time. That's, uh, you should. Follow your passions. Make stuff that you, you think is awesome. Um, let's see here. Some more Francis Manipal. Yes, he's amazing. And um, <laughs> Christian asked if my wife is mowing the lawn. Um, we have some gardeners here cutting down an overgrown tree in our backyard. <laughs> So, yeah, if the lawn needs to be mowing, my wife is going to have my ass out there doing it. She ain't going to be mowing the lawn. But, um, yeah, so I guess I didn't realize that those noises were so loud they were getting picked up on the camera. But, yeah, there's, there's yard work going on. Um, apologies if that's a little too much. And Ian Rocks, I guess I, I answered that, or at least I think I did, when he asked about um, whether I'd heard of Webtoons and would I consider it. Um, I wouldn't do a Webtoons exclusive I would want to do it on my site and then also share it on Webtoons. So I would look at Webtoons the same way I look at Instagram or Twitter or any other social network where it's just another way for me to share my works but have it lead back to my own site. So yeah, I if I do, a, um, I may try it. That's one of the reasons why the, I'm going to do a one-shot follow-up to Eye of the Gods before I do my, um, my four-issue miniseries. Specifically because I want to test out different platforms, different page layouts that are more 
digital and mobile friendly. And I want to experiment a little bit more before I dive into a really long project. Because after the Morningstar, I mean, after, after the Eye of the Gods follow-up pieces, I have another book that... The way I'm playing it out, it will either be the same length as Morningstar, like another eight issues, or it could grow into being something like 12 issues or longer. And I'm really trying to figure out the best way to tell that story. And it's not that I want to tell some magnum opus that's like a, you know, 24 issue, 30 issue, 50 issue, 100 issue. I prefer shorter stories. But as I continue to challenge myself as a writer, it also means I'm doing projects that keep growing in, in scope in terms of like complexity and that ends up pushing the story to be longer. So maybe the real challenge is how can I tell a really complex story in a shorter format without it feeling rushed or compacted but still being quality. Like you know the whole thing Mark Twain says I wrote a long letter because I didn't have the time to write a short one. That may be the uh, the real challenge for me in uh, my, my follow-up projects. And, uh, and I feel bad guys that I'm not drawing while I'm talking but it's because I'm really paying attention to the chat and want to make sure I answer all of these questions. Um, and these are, you guys are asking really, really great, great questions and that require me to think. And it means I, I can't really just draw and sort of doodle around while I'm, while I'm doing these. So, um, Bear Bear asks, how long does it normally take to make a normal length story? It's different for every artist. A normal length story Typically, Marvel and DC Comics are 22 pages of art. They've, they've gone back and forth between being 20 and 22. Um, it also depends on how much time you're working on the artwork. Because in terms of my actual pacing, I can draw about a page in about eight hours. So that would actually keep me at that eight hours, at that a page a day rate that the average Marvel or DC artist usually works. The problem being is that I usually get one, maybe two hours a day to work on comics, meaning that I could draw at the pace that a a monthly artist works, but I could only, but I only get the time to work at that pace at a quarter to an eighth of the time, meaning that I put out instead of putting out a monthly book, my dream would be able to be working my full-time job and still put out a book every quarter. The best I've ever done was finishing two and a half issues in one year. That's the best I've ever gotten. I was hoping to get up to slowly get up to three issues a year and then be able to get up to four issues a year. And over the past two years, I've fallen backwards and gone much slower, where now I'm only getting like one issue a year done. Um, so I need to work on getting my speed back up. Um, but yeah, I think aiming for... Yeah, aiming for a page a day or a page in eight hours is a reasonable length. That would mean that a comic, you know, you could do about a comic a month. But that's, but again, if you're only able to put in a few hours a day, it's going to take longer. Which is another reason why when you're starting out, it's better to aim for short one shots or like two or three issue like volume stories or four issue, you know, something where you're keeping it short. Just because, it again, Christian popped in. He said, I have a comic, and let me tell you, it's looking at years. It's a long process, homie, but fulfilling. Dude, Christian, you're my brother from another mother. Um, another one, thanks for the answers. And I, I apologize that I don't read Cyrillic, so I can't give you a, a shout-out by name. But it's the uh, the Cyrillic name in the, the chat there. Um, you're more than welcome for the answers. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs> Christian's cracking me up again. He says I should get her meeting my wife a lemonade stand. Well, I'm in LA and actually normally it's hot all year. This is one of the few times where it's been cold and the last thing she wants is to be out there trying to, it's not lemonade weather. It'll get, it's going to get hot real quick in LA when it does. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Bear Bear said my questions aren't as good. That is wrong. Why do you think I've been spending so much time answering your questions? You're asking very good questions. Um, and a lot of times questions that people have when they're starting out causes me to rethink and reevaluate my process and how I've gotten to where I am and how I'm practicing making art, making comics. Because there's never a point where you have it all done and figured out. There's, I've developed strategies that allow me to work better or in some cases more efficiently. 
but I'm still tweaking and adjusting and changing and growing. And there may be something I might learn next year that will make a, a massive shift in my, my work and I may completely change my process. I may decide one day to go all digital and that will revolutionize my process. I may decide to stop doing digital altogether and I may start painting comics in acrylic. I don't think I'm gonna do that, but I'm open to letting my process grow and change because this isn't just about the product. It's about our personal creative growth. And in the end, that growth is for us. It's not for viewers or an audience or hopefully having people that are fans or supporters. The actual making of the art is because it, we connect, it connects us to something greater than ourselves. And that keep being open to learning and changing is integral to that connection. So on that note, I think that we are going to wrap it up. So you guys have asked some great questions and I'm sorry, Christian, I know I, I wish I could have spent more time actually painting, painting while we were talking, but I think that the conversation that we had today is worth sacrificing that. Cause this I think was, a, was like one of the best chats ever. And I mean, you guys watching get better and better with every week. And when I say that, I mean, I appreciate you. Like I appreciate, I appreciate people taking the time to be interested in my work and, and in watching my creative process. But I mean that the connection that you guys have and the stuff that you share and the questions you ask make me feel better about having a, a community of people that are engaged in what I'm doing. And that, that's, that's fantastic. That makes me really happy. It makes, it makes me feel like what I'm doing and what I'm sharing is really worthwhile. So thank you guys for showing up, for being here. You guys have made this really worthwhile. Um, so wrapping up real quick, again, one more time, just for people that jumped into the middle and didn't see the beginning or didn't see when I mentioned this before, if you want to support this channel, um, if you want to get bonus uh, videos and live streams, there's one I just recorded and posted yesterday for, uh, for Patreon subscribers only. Um, you can go to patreon.com slash Jeremy. I've got a $2 a month tier. A uh, five dollar month tier. You can. There's also a. You can do custom and pay what you want. Um, supporting the channel, you get advanced blog posts, more behind the scenes artwork, more videos. Um, if you'd like to read my comics for free, you get a sample of uh, of each issue, and also of my original graphic novel. There's a 30 page preview of my first graphic novel, Eye of the Gods. Go to comics.jeremy.net. You can check all those out. And again, if you would like to buy some of my comics physically or Amazon Kindle, you can go to uh, amazon.jeremy.net. So again, thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. That's it for now. Go be creative. <laughs>